Hey, everybody, what's going on? Chuck Fulkerson here with TradersArmy.com. Hope you guys are having a great evening. I've got a lot of requests recently for big picture market opportunities. What is the big picture market telling us? What is it telling us uh, as far as what we should be looking for in this current market environment? There's no question we are in a period of abnormal market volatility. We have seen the biggest market up days, the biggest market down days, and the predominant feeling that I hear from most investors is fear. Fear that it's gonna go down more. Fear that they don't know what to do. Fear that they don't know what to do with their money in this kind of a market environment. So tonight is not about being a trader. Um, tonight is, a, is all about our long-term buckets and what can we do in our long-term long -term wealth buckets. When we talk about our long-term wealth buckets, we're specifically talking about our 401k accounts, our IRAs, the money we have earmarked for retirement. I wanna give you some ideas that you can at least consider when looking at the big picture. And we're gonna be looking at the, at the market and it charts from a big picture perspective and where we think that it might go over the next few weeks or months. Uh, but remember that what's great about understanding the financial markets is, is that even if I'm wrong, I can place automatic protective stop measures in place to get me out if I go the wrong way. So as we look at this, just think about how is it and what do I wanna do with that capital? Because the, what I care about is how do I control my risk? How do I manage my risk? And so for most people that are in a 401k, if you've been in a 401k, you're probably in mutual funds. And the mutual funds that you've been in have probably experienced a tremendously large run to the upside as the market has also gone up. And now during this pullback, it gets people to wonder, now what should I do? What should I do with my money? It, well, honestly, that's a very personal decision. And that's gonna deter be, be determined on a lot of factors. What's your age? What's your outcome? What is your goal? What is your risk tolerance? How much capital do you have now? So I can't give you an exact answer for what you want to do. You're going to want to consult your financial advisor, financial professional for something like that. But what I can do is give you some ideas about big picture market direction. So I'm going to share some charts with you tonight that hopefully will make some sense. So let's go ahead and go to the charts. So the charts that we're going to spend our time on today, uh, we're going to start by looking at the S&P 500 index. So the chart you can see in front of you is the S&P 500 index. This is a very simple chart to read. And if you are not, if you're not new to reading charts, what you're looking at here is what's called a candlestick chart. Each candlestick you see uh, represents a day's worth of price action. So how do I know that it represents a day? Very simply, this little, this little thing up here at the top that says D means that everything we're looking at here represents a one day's worth of time. So a red candlestick means that, that during this day, price went down. A green candlestick means that during this day, price went up. That's simply all it tells me. Very easy to see. Now, one of the things that I first want to point out is simply the size of the candlesticks. When I look at this period of time, as the markets were were going up and, and even when they, when they were kind of going sideways there for a while, look at the size of our daily candlesticks. Whereas compared to the size of our candlesticks today, right? Now that is the definition of volatility. What you're seeing there when I highlight that is the very definition of volatility. And I can zoom in more and you can see it a bit more clearly. This, these don't look like very big days. Well, they're not very big in comparison to the moves we've had recently. And that's what's led to a lot of the fear that we've seen in the market. So when we look at what the market has done from the high of 33.93 to the low of 21.91, that was a drop of about seven, uh, 35%. So you can see that up in that little box up at the top, it says negative 35.53%. So we had a drop of about 35%. Now, interestingly enough, we've had a rise from the low up to the high of today of about 25%. But this is the problem with overall investing mindset is, a, you know, if you think about it, in normal math, if I have a 35% drawdown and then I have a 20%, a 25% correction, right? What should I be? Well, we would think that I should be only down 10%. That would, be, that would be what the math would tell us, right? Is that I would only be down 10%, right? Minus 35% plus 25% 
I should only be down 10%, right? Well, that is unfortunately not the case. That's not the way percentages work when we look at those markets. So if we look at from the high to where we are today, we're actually down 20% twice as much as what the math would tell us that we should be down. Now, the reason for that is because we need a bigger move back up in order to, to make up for the moves back down. So we dropped 35%, we've rallied back up 25%, and we're still down 20% overall in the market. So what does that mean for the future? Well, if you've got a large time horizon and you're not overly concerned, you know, somebody said one time to Warren Buffett, how did you hang on in 08 when everybody lost all that money. How much money did you lose? And he says, I didn't lose anything because I didn't sell. And so his point being, he didn't think that America was going to go bankrupt. And that's okay. If you've got that thought and you've got that belief, then certainly there's nothing wrong with hanging on. And matter of fact, this is where a lot of professionals will talk to you about this concept of dollar cost averaging and buying more when it goes lower. Let's look at it from a, from a bigger picture perspective. And when I say a bigger pic, pic, picture perspective, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the last 20 years worth of time, and I'm going to look at that in a monthly time period, meaning each candlestick is going to represent one month. Now, when I look at where we are today, I can see that we've had that tremendous pullback. Um, so far, actually, for the month of April, we've got a green candlestick, which means that we've gone up since the month of April. But what I'm looking for are areas of what I call imbalance and areas where buy orders and sell orders come together at, a, at, a, at an equilibrium point. And we can see one of those points right here in this rectangle. So right here in this rectangle, what, what we can see is that, that we had price for about five months right in there, essentially going nowhere. It basically went sideways. Well, when prices are basically going sideways, what does that tell me? Well, it tells me that buyers are essentially equal to sellers. And since those buyers were equal to sellers in that period of time, we saw that there was an equilibrium of price. Now, as price went away and moved up, we know for certain that not every buyer at that area was able to get their orders filled or else price never would have moved away, right? If we think about it the way we think about anything else in life, price moves away. Now, when price returned back to that area, Notice that when price came back into, uh, into this, this, uh, this level, what you see is that we had price hit that level. That's what this little line here is. That's called a wick. Price hit that level and rallied back up. Now, what that means is that at this area, there was, a, there was some pent-up demand, right? There was some pent-up demand inside of this area, and that pent-up demand inside of that area really caused prices to rally up. Now, the question becomes this, is there enough pent up demand left in that area for prices to stop there again if we come back? And we look at the concepts of demand and supply, and certainly we know that when demand is greater than supply, prices go up. And at this point, price certainly was. Now, if we come back down into here, what I'm gonna look for is the next area of consolidation that looks like this. Now, I'm not saying that we're going to come back into here, but if we do, I need to look for the next area of sideways price action and consolidation that looks like this. So for me to find that, I actually have to come all the way down to here. This would be the level that I identify as my next cleanest area of consolidation. Now, this is coincidentally also the same area that was the top back here, right? So in the, o, in, in, the, uh, in the 07, 08 market drop, this was the top of that period. And if I go back to the year 2000, it was also basically the top there. There's an old saying that says price has memory. And so I do believe that if, 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 we, can, if we break through that next level down, if we break through that next level down, I think it is very possible, this being a very important point, I think it's very possible that the next most probable area where we would see price return would be somewhere down in here. Now, what would that mean for our accounts? Well, for our 401k accounts and our IRAs, that, that level, and let me redraw that level here,
I'll put it in yellow just so that it's very easy to see. So that level down in here would take us to about 1690 or so in the S&P. Now, from current price, that would be a further decline of about 36% from where we are today. All in all, from the highs down to there, that would be about a 50% decline. Now, you might say, well, that 50% that decline, Chuck, that sounds irrational, right? That sounds way too big. Well, I, I would say that, and, and I would, would caution against it being too big, except for the fact that uh, let me move this out to go, we're gonna go back more than 20 years on our monthly time period. Let's look at our last two big market corrections. And the first being the, the Y2K bubble. In the Y2K bubble, the market's corrected 52%, approximately 52.9%. In the credit collapse of 07 and 08, we corrected about 58%. So this is, you know, quite possibly the worst economic, a worse economic condition than both of those. Um, and I think that a 50% correction is a, a fairly fair, reasonable estimate. So what can I do if we get down to there? Well, there's a couple of things you can do if you get down into there um, that are simple and easy to do. And I'm, I'm just going to give you a couple of ideas and things to consider. Number one is, not, number one is the simplest and probably the easiest. It's to go to cash. It's simply to go to cash. Now, why would I go to cash? Well, because when I go to cash, I'm not saying to stay out of the market, but if we do come back down into this range, you now have more cash left in order to buy more at a lower cost. So people talk about dollar cost averaging, and while I, I don't necessarily always agree with dollar cost averaging, I think the dollar cost averaging has a point if you're going to cash when you're higher up uh, before the bigger moves down. So there's option number one is to go to cash. Now, is it possible that if I go to cash, I miss out on a big run up? Absolutely it is. And that is the thing to consider. Um, option number two is to draw what I call a line in the sand. Now a line in the sand is an important concept in the world of investing. We're gonna talk about drawing a line in the sand. And when I say drawing a line in the sand, I mean a point where if I'm still in the market today, where do I draw the line in the sand to say it's time to get out, right? Well, looking at our daily chart, so I went down from a monthly to a daily. Looking at our daily chart, I think that it's safe to say that if we drop below this level here again, 24, 2450, 2400, somewhere in there, I think it's safe to say that we're going to continue to go significantly lower. Um, now, there are ways that you can use what are called uh, indicators, technical indicators to give you some clues. Uh, and so if I, if I just add a study here, and I'm going to add a very simple study called a moving average and, um, and, and a, simple, a simple moving average at that. So these are all different indicators. There's a tremendous amount of indicators available to look at, but we're gonna look at one called a simple moving average. Now, this simple moving average, what I'm gonna do is look at a 50-day simple moving average. Now, 50 days means that it takes the average closing price of the last 50 days and averages that out to give you a number. This is a very common average that investors will use as a tool to get in and out of the marketplace, right? Well, we are clearly well below the 50-day moving average. Matter of fact, we, we what's called gapped below the 50-day and have stayed well below the 50-day. If we stay below that 50-day moving average, I think it's okay to, if you're already out, to stay out until we get above it. If you're not in it, you know, you, you, it allows you to, uh, to, to take a little bit of solace. If you want to be a little bit more aggressive, you don't have to use the 50 day. You can use what's called the 20 day moving average, which is essentially the last month worth of trading. It gives you the average price over the last month. So we've now crossed above that 20, right? Now, once again, we've stayed below that 20 all through this down move. If you wanted to be a little bit more active, you could simply say, okay, my line in the sand is this 20-day moving average. If we go below that 20-day moving average, I'm going to either go to cash um, 
or I'm going to reallocate my investments. Now, where might I reallocate my investments? You might want to reallocate those investments in a couple of different areas. So uh, you could certainly go to cash. You can also look at bond funds and see if there's any bond funds available uh, that make sense for your portfolio. They may or may not. It depends on what you're looking at. Um, there are other opportunities as well uh, if you want to look at ad additional maybe uh, index funds at lower cost basis. So specifically index funds, when you start to get to a lower cost basis, might be something for people to consider and to look at. Now, that's if you are concerned about the next leg down. What if I want to capitalize on the move heading up? What are some things that I can do? Well, one of the tools that we oftentimes use as investors are sector analysis charts. So what I'm going to do is look at the different sectors. And very simply, to make it, to make it on a grand scale, a very, a very high level scale, the, the stock market itself, think of the stock market itself as this big box, right? Well, that market is broken up into different sectors, right? So you have an energy sector. You have a, um, you might have a technology sector. You might have a healthcare sector, right? And so on and so forth. Now, each one of those sectors, for example, if I just look at the energy sector, that energy sector is then broken down again into different what are called industry groups and they're all various sizes right so maybe you have um maybe you have refining um maybe you have solar maybe you have you know all the different energy and then that industry group is now that where your individual companies come from i think that if you're going to invest in the market in a volatile time it makes sense to look at whole sectors so a way that we can do that is look at the comparison of multiple sectors so what i've got here is a chart of multiple sectors and they're all compared to the s p 500 now these sectors are uh various ones this is the energy sector so energy which is uh which is down 47 percent uh recently now by the way that that 47 percent that it's down that is over the past one year. So over the past one year, the energy sector is down 47%. Uh, the technology sector is only down 11%. Financials is down uh, 31%. Communications is down 16.5%. Uh, XLY is what's called consumer discretionary, which is only down about 20% uh, compared to the market in general. XLU are utilities. XLI are industrials. XLRE is real estate. This is the real estate sector. XLP are our consumer staples. XLV is healthcare. XLB is basic materials. And then SPY, that's our entire S&P 500. So looking at this, what this allows me to very quickly do is to ascertain how are all the sectors comparing relative to the S&P? So if I very simply want to look, which sectors are underperforming the S&P? Well, the S&P is down 18%. We know that energy is underperforming. We know that financials are underperforming. Consumer discretionary, industrials, and basic materials are all underperforming. Which are the ones that are overperforming? Well, technology is overperforming. It's only down 11%. Uh, communications utilities, real estate, um, consumer staples, healthcare are all outperforming the S&P in general. Now, the S&P in general is down, so every sector is also down, but you have to imagine there are some sectors that are down less. In this case, our strongest sector is 
consumer staples. Well, why are consumer staples our strongest sector? Well, think about what people are doing. They're going grocery shopping. They're going to Walmart. These are all consumer staples stocks. I do not think that when the market rebounds and starts to rocket up, consumer staples will be the best one. I think that right now it's become a flight to quality. I think that when we begin to rocket back up, no surprise that we will be led out of this by technology. Technology to me is by far our top performing sector um, if the markets go bullish again. And this would be the sector that I would want to lean towards for my opportunities. Uh, the other sector that I would want to lean for for opportunities would probably be consumer discretionary because consumer discretionary has been very much hit. Discretionary spending is down tremendously. I think that this one may take a little longer to recover, but might recover very strong when it does. Typically, technology and financials are the ones that lead us out of a recession. Um, followed then by consumer discretionary. But this to me would be the one that I would spend probably the most time in. So if you say, okay, I'm looking for an opportunity to pick some stocks up at a low cost, I think you're going to be able to find more of those opportunities inside of technology. Now, what's great is, let me just expand on this technology chart. If you decided to say, I want to buy the technology sector, you could still have a line in the sand for the technology sector. And when I were, if I were to look at that technology sector and, and, and put the, the line in the sand, let me, let me put this on a, uh, on a much bigger chart here. And let me get it off of percentages so we can see the actual price. I can own the technology sector for about $82 a share. Uh, now, looking at the weekly chart, so now each one of these candlesticks represents a week, uh, I can see that the technology sector has gone from $70 to $82 in the last three weeks. Think about that, from $70 to $82. Well, what kind of a move is that? Well, that's a move of from $70 to $82 is approximately 18% rally in the last three weeks alone. That is a very strong move for most investors. Now, I will say that I'm a little bit concerned that if the whole market rolls, rolls over, this will also roll over, but I don't know that it will fall quite as far. So this is an opportunity to say, if you are overall wanting to be a bull in this market, I, you know, we, we, we went, notice that today is a red candlestick, which means we went up and traded down all day today. So you're getting it at a little bit of a lower price than you would have even earlier today. Um, it might make sense uh, if we look at this little sideways area here to say that if price comes back into this 7750 range, that I think I'd be a buyer uh, of that stock. But I'm going to make sure that if it goes below, call it 7570, I get out. I call it a line in the sand. And this allows me to, to be speculative as an investor without having to take too much exposure and too much risk. Now, what if all I have is a 401k and I don't have access to these funds? Now, these are called ETFs, exchange traded funds. You can still utilize the funds that are available inside of your 401k and maybe use these as proxies to give you the analysis to make those decisions. I think that that's a, that's a strategy very worth doing. So these are all you know, ways that you can manage that bigger picture portfolio. Certainly, I know it's not for everybody. And so if that's something that you want to learn more about, please you know, contact us, go to, uh, you can send us an email, support at tradersarmy.com. We're here to answer any questions that you have. We've actually got a, uh, the availability to text us. Just go to tradersarmy.com. You can get the information on how you can text us. Any questions you have, we're here to help you. I know our name is Traders Army, but really we're here for everybody. And you don't have to be a member of the site for us to help you. I just want to be able to be there to help everybody, investors, traders, everybody alike, so that you can stay safe, you can protect your income and your wealth that you've worked so hard for all your life in these you know, troublesome economic times. So thank you so much for joining us on this session. If you like this video, do me a favor, give it a like, give it a thumbs up, share it with some friends. I appreciate you joining and I will talk to you soon. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you.